Because people are seeing this fire as an omen. They're saying that the gods are angry because if they do this to Tim Jin, they will do this to China. And there's a real sort of knock on effect in the political system because people are saying this must be the end of the Communist Party. And that's why there's so much censorship of this fire. Well, you know, we've spoken about this in, in the past. I mean, the, the modus operandi of totalitarian or authoritarian regimes are to control the information. But in this case, you, you're saying that this, uh, this has a symbolic um, effect? Well, well, certainly, because they're seeing the broader significance of this. And we've got to remember that the world would not have known of this fire but really for microbloggers, Chinese microbloggers, who got onto the Internet, who talked about this. Now, Chinese censors immediately took down their posts and then Xinhua, the official news agency, then put out its version. And we can be sure that these death totals are really understated because of the magnitude of what happened. Clearly there are more casualties than Beijing is willing to admit to. Mm -hmm. And Gordon, are there going to be economic repercussions to this? Well, it really depends because this is coming at a really bad time for the party. You have the devaluation of the currency, which is spooking the Chinese people. You have the stock market coming down. You've got the economy in very bad shape, much worse than Beijing says that it is. So, you know, this is not a good thing for China right now, especially because if it changes people's psychology, and, and that could actually reverberate across the country. And, you know, what happens to China doesn't stay in China, it's going to affect the global economy, as it already has, we've seen in the last couple days with this mm -hmm. devaluation. Gordon Chang, always a pleasure to see you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I want to get back to the uh, story. The, the Secretary of State John Kerry's trip to Cuba tomorrow to formally open the U.S. Embassy there. He'll be meeting with the Cuban Foreign Minister Bruno Rodriguez. He is not scheduled to meet with either Fidel Castro or his brother Raul. Secretary Kerry also told me he wants to take the opportunity to meet with the Cuban people. I will take an open, free walk uh, in uh, Old Havana at some point in the day, and I look forward to meeting whoever I meet and listening to them and having the, you know, whatever views come at me. So uh, the United States, I can assure you in this effort, after 54 years of seeing zero progress, one of the things we negotiated is the ability of our diplomats to be able to meet with people in Cuba and not to be restrained. And I believe the people of Cuba benefit by virtue of that presence and that ability. Mauricio Claver Caron is director of the U.S. Cuba Democracy Pact, which opposes the Castro regime. Mauricio, thanks for being with me. Thank you, Jose. So the secretary says that he's going to actually walk through the streets of Havana sometime tomorrow, and whoever wants to talk to him and whoever wants to bring up whatever issue is going to be free to do so. What could possibly be wrong with that? Yeah, well, the fact is that Old Havana is run by a company called Abaguanex, which is owned by the Council of State and the regime, and therefore they're putting a fresh coat of paint for the Secretary Kerry's visit. So they, obviously the regime knows beforehand uh, about this uh, walk and stroll. But if he wants to talk to the Cuban people, he should have began with those dissidents, those dissidents that are not going to be allowed to participate at the embassy event. And I hate to break it to you, Jose, but the Secretary was dishonest to you in his interview. He said that this is a question of space, but the fact is the U.S. Interest, the, Q, the U.S. Embassy now in Havana is five times the size of the Cuban Embassy. Embassy in Washington, D.C., where 500 people were invited, including Code Pink that was out there partying outside. And yet now, they're not going to allow these Cuban dissidents at this event in order to raise our flag but lowering our standards in regards to human rights. Instead, they're going to meet with these dissidents in, in a closet. So we're going to sweep human rights under the rug, and then we're going to put the dissidents along with the broom in the closet so that, in quietly, uh, the secretary can essentially uh, uh, check that box rather than highlighting. So Those are the people that represent—I'm sorry. No, no, I'm sorry. Just uh, I want to say, because Kerry defended some of the decisions being made in relation to Cuba and the Castros, here's part of what he told me. Cuba was removed from the state sponsor of uh, terrorism list this year. It was also removed from the uh, list of uh, human trafficking from the bottom to the top. Is there anything the United States is not willing to do to have relations with the Cuban government? Uh, there are thousands of things we're not willing to do, and none of those things that you just mentioned are in fact a reflection of our decision to open diplomatic relations with the Cuban government. Mauricio, the secretary is very clear. He says none of that has anything to do with the interests of the United States in having relations with an island after more than 50 years when not having relations didn't apparently do too much for the benefit of the Cuban people. 
Yeah, well, when we did, we've always had relations with Cuba. Well, we had relations with the Cuban people, meaning with the Cuban democracy movement. When that flag goes up tomorrow, the people that represent those interests of freedom and democracy are those people that were getting arrested just last Sunday. Since the president's announcement, there's been over 3,000 political arrests in Cuba. And as the head of the Ladies in White, which is the movement of the wives and mothers and other relatives of Cuban political prisoners, said the other day, the way that this has all been interpreted is as a green light, a green light for repression in Cuba. It continues to increase daily. And, and unfortunately, rather than standing up for these people that represent the best interests of that flag that's going up, we're lowering our standards and saying we want to talk about it and we want to deal with everything beforehand. In regards to the terrorism list, in regards to the human trafficking list, even the State Department itself admitted that the Cuba continues to harbor one of the most wanted FBI uh, terrorists, that they continue to do uh, and be involved in sex trafficking and forced labor throughout the world, and has given no valid justification for any of these things. And now we're essentially saying that in regards to human rights, we haven't spoken out about it in the last six or seven months. And frankly, when Secretary Kerry was in the United States Senate, he was known for blocking support for senators. And therefore, you know, and also the trail throughout the world. You know, ask Iranian dissidents, ask Syrian so, dissidents. Yeah. You know, what is what is what 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 hope do they have just looking at how the administration has dealt with these other countries and their dissidents throughout the throughout its administration? Mauricio Claver-Caron, thank you for your perspective. Appreciate your time. Thank you, Jose. At least 67 people are dead today from an early morning truck bombing in a busy marketplace in Baghdad. It didn't take long for the...